Math 43, welcome to the chapter 5-6 keynote. Um, let's summarize what we did a little bit in chapter 4, and then we're going to move on to chapters 5 and 6. So we're breaking down over these next three chapters, or really I guess four, four, five, six, seven. 5, um, how do we deal with numerical variables and categorical variables? And in numerical, we have discrete and continuous, and then categorical are non-numeric. Now chapter 4 dealt with discrete. All right, and let's just review that. So we took a look at PDFs, and this is where you could make a list of your sample space, right? which is different from continuous, what we saw in chapter five and six. We couldn't make a list of the possible values. We had to give a range of possible values. But if you can make a list, because you have a discrete numerical variable, make that table, and then those probabilities have to total out to one each time. And you've got your mean formula, your variance formula, and you could calculate probabilities, right? And then we have the special case, the binomial, where once we pass these four properties, we were in a binomial experiment, right? And still we had a probability formula, we had a mean formula, and we had a standard deviation formula. But we were using binomial PDF and binomial CDF down here to calculate those probabilities. And then we would use the complement rule for, um, what a, let me back this up, for PDF we had the equal sign, and for CDF we had the less than, an equal to, less than or equal to sign. And if you had a greater than symbol, a greater than or equal to, or a strictly less than, you had to use a combination of one of these two to calculate that probability. And that's what we did in discrete land, and that was great. But now let's take it over and look at continuous numerical variables. And that's what we uh, looked at in chapters five and six. Chapter five was the uniform distribution, and chapter six was the standard normal, and then the regular normal curve. And so with those, the, the distributions, instead of making a table, we're gonna make a graph. And the most common one, there's the uniform distribution. And again, you can see that my variable down here goes from A to B. I can't make a list, I have to actually make a graph of the possible values in my variable. When you hear uniform, it literally means that the height up here is the same for every single value. And whatever this number here is on the bottom, whatever the width of that rectangle, the height is its reciprocal. All right, and in terms of the, the normal curve, let me just undo my markings here. Take a look at those four normal distributions and pause just for a moment. And between the red, green, blue, and purple, which one is the standard normal curve? If you take a look at it, if I said, hey, one of those four in there, just because I, I grabbed this from Google Images, one of them is the standard normal curve. So let's just try and break this down. Which one is the standard normal curve? Well, when I'm talking about the standard normal curve, we're talking about z-scores. They are still normally distributed, but they're centered at one and, excuse me, they're centered at zero and have a standard deviation of one. Well, if they're centered at zero, that rules out the purple curve, right? And then if, if we take a look, well, where, which of these curves has a standard deviation of one? Well, you can see that here I'm given the variance because it's sigma squared. But if you look at the green curve, you see the variance is one. And if I took the square root of that number, that would also be one. So, so this green curve is actually the standard normal curve. And just one other thing to take note of, I want you to see, at least with these three curves, the red, green, and blue curve, you can see that as you move from red to green to blue, the variance is getting larger. And I want you to see that the peaks are getting smaller. Right, so the more spread out you are, like on this blue curve, the more spread out you are, the lower the height, right? It doesn't get that tall. All right, and you can see on the standard normal curve, you're a little bit more spread out, right? You have a higher variance, meaning you're spread out more. You have a little bit of a higher peak. And then here on this red curve, you're really not that spread out. Ooh, that is not the best tracing job. And you can see, you got a pretty high peak. All right, okay. So moving from there, in terms of probabilities, if I wanna calculate a probability, on a continuous curve, I'm gonna go with area under the curve. Now, if we have the uniform distribution, we're gonna use base times height. Oops, base times height. We're always gonna use that to figure this out, all right? And now, if we have a normal curve, we're gonna use normal CDF. This is the one where we don't have the calculus under our belts to actually calculate this the longer way, and, and we don't need to. We've got technology to do it now, so let's use it. And while I only showed you in this class two um, continuous distributions, there's plenty out there. There's the Poissons, there's the Exponential. I even Google imaged a fancier one where it was a triangle distribution and you would still find probability by using an area formula. 
an area formula either from like a geometry class or we would have technology to do it. All right, so let's let's take a look at that uniform distribution. So in terms of constructing this graph, right, you're gonna put your variable on the x-axis, probability along the y, right? That's analogous to putting the, or labeling the top row of your table as x and the bottom row of your table as probability. And whatever this number is here, whatever this distance, right? And you'll hear me refer to it as b minus a, right? Whatever that distance is, the height is the reciprocal of that. So what I mean is, if this was 4, then this would be a 1 fourth here. Oops, let me make that a fraction. There we go. All right. Now, the mean of this is always a plus b over 2. It's halfway. It's the average between a and b. Halfway through, whatever the midpoint is, there's, there's your mean. And the standard deviation has a, an uglier formula, square root of b minus a squared over 12. And you don't have to memorize these. Again, you have that trait table that you should be using in these chapters. If I wanted to get to variance, I would square this number, right? Square this number to get to variance. Because the relationship between the standard deviation and variance is always the same, right? From standard deviation, square it to get to variance. From variance, take the square root to get the standard deviation. Another way of saying is square this number to get the variance is if you just didn't have the square root symbol there, that would be the variance. Now, in terms of calculating probabilities, we're going to go with base times height. All right, so that was the chapter 5 distribution that we picked up. In chapter 6, we picked up two more. We picked up the standard normal curve and then just the regular normal curve. Standard normal means that there are z-scores over here on the x-axis, right? Zero is always under the peak, and then you scale your deviations by 1, 2, 3, and then negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. So in general... All right. In general, if you go about six standard deviations on this x-axis, or in this case, the z-axis, there are about six standard deviations on any given axis of a normal distribution. Right? Three up, three back. Now, data values can be more than three deviations above or three deviations below. But as we talked about with the empirical rule, 99.7% of our data values are within three standard deviations of the mean. All right, so z-scores, right? Zero is always under the peak. One is always the standard deviation. Now, if you want to calculate a probability, and I'm just giving you a greater than version, right? So if I wanted to go greater than, I don't know, pick a number. We'll just put the number right here. Actually, let me undo that. Let me put a different color here just so we can see it. If this was the number and I wanted to go greater than, Right, we know when we go all the way out to the right here, we get an infinity. So my low is that number, my high is infinity, which we're going to write in our calculator as 1E99. And then the mean and standard deviation for z-scores is always 0 and 1. Now, on a regular normal distribution, if you, uh, I'm going to do a little side note here. If you ever get to Math 2 or Calc 2, you're, they're going to talk about this formula, and that is actually the formula for this um, normal distribution. It's awesome. It takes two antiderivatives to find the area under the curve. It is a good time. All right, but all that being said, I'm going to undo that because we don't really need it in this class. Um, we've got that this curve, right, normally distributed, mu is here under the peak, and then you can go about mu plus sigma, 2 sigma, 3 sigma, right? Mu minus sigma, minus 2 sigma, minus 3 sigma. And if I wanted to think about this in terms of z-scores, right? Negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. That's always the case if you relabel something with z-scores, okay? All right, now in terms of calculating a probability, actually let me back up some of the stuff I wrote just so it doesn't get too cramped. Let's say I wanted to say what's the probability that x is less than a number, and I'll put the number, we'll go here this time out, right? Let's say the number was here. If I wanted to go less than, I'm going to go to the left, right? So my low is negative infinity. My high is that number. And then you put in the back two positions, the mean and the standard deviation. Right? And that's how you calculate any probability, whether you're on the standard normal curve or the normal curve. You're always using normal CDF. Never use normal PDF, always normal CDF. All right, now we're going to play a fun little game. What if I gave you the probability that x is equal to a number, right? So exactly equal to a number, not less than, less than or equal to, greater than or greater than or equal to, just equal to. And we did this in one of our examples in chapter six. All right, so get ahead of me, big reveal. It's, oh, 
There you go. Oh, oh. All right. I'm hoping you're thinking zero because the probability that you're exactly, and I'll, I'll, I'll change colors here, exactly one number under this peak, there's no, there's no width here, right? So there's no, I know we're not talking base times height, but there's no base if you were thinking of that as a rectangle. That's why that probability will always be zero. Okay, so let's review up z-scores. We introduced them in chapter two, and I said they would come back around in chapter six, and here they are. So z-scores, this was the formula that we picked up in chapter two. Value minus mean over standard deviation. Or I can say my x value minus my mu divided by my sigma, right? And it takes data sets that are on different scales and puts them on a common scale so that we can compare data values from these different scales. Right? It tells you how many standard deviations above or below the mean any data value is. So if you have a z-score of 2, you're 2 deviations above the mean. Right? Z-score of negative 3, 3 deviations below the mean. Z-score of 0, you're actually on the mean. Right? And it doesn't have to be integer values. You could have a z-score of 1.2. Then you're 1.2 standard deviations above the mean. Positive z-scores are above the mean. Negative z-scores are below the mean. Okay? All right. We also talked about the empirical rule, and I want to emphasize that the empirical rule deals with the middle of your, of your data, right? The middle percent. And why I'm stressing the middle is because your calculator does not deal with this. Your calculator is dealing with percentiles, right? So this on down. So I talked about in this chapter how we have to get comfortable with going from the middle 68, 95, 99, 7, Right, that the empirical rule is telling us, and we have to convert that over to percentiles so we can use our calculator. All right, so the empirical rule says, hey, if you go one deviation in either direction, right, one deviation up to one deviation down, that's 68% of your data. Now, if I wanted to rescale this as z-scores, right, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. You can always rescale things to z-scores. That's why it is the standard normal distribution. Now in terms of this 68%, we've talked about how through symmetry there is 34% on each side. All right, so if you go one deviation in either direction, middle 68% of your data. Two standard deviations in either direction, 95% of your data, middle 95. And then three standard deviations in either direction, is 99.7% of your data. So if you're looking at the middle, and I'll, I'll rework this, all right, so ignore these numbers now. If you're looking at the middle 99.7% of your data, keep in mind you have 0.15% still over here and 0.15% still over here, right? And that's from the complement rule. So again, middle percents. And now let's talk about how we go from something like this, right, the empirical rule, and get to a point where we can use our calculator. So let's convert this to percentiles. So a percentile is some value such that blank percent of the observations in the data set fall below that value, right? This on down idea. So let's take a look at our, our regular old normal curve. Now you can see X is labeled here. If I wanted to make a label down here, these would be the Z scores, right? Negative three, negative two, negative one, so on and so forth. And let's talk about how if I went one deviation up to below, oops, it, let me back that up. Ah, 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 is there a way to back it up? Yeah, I did it, there we go, <laughs> sorry, sorry, got it. If I did one deviation below to one deviation above, so let me, let me reiterate this, I'm gonna go from here to here, right? Z-score of negative one to a Z-score of one. That is the middle 68% of my data, and that's why you're seeing the 34 on a side from symmetry. Okay, so let me back that out so we can see that. Now I want you to keep in mind 68%, 34 on a side. Now let's start to talk about percentiles. All right, and I always think initially this percentile, we can, we can feel this one out. Like we can see, okay, you know what? That's gonna be the 50th percentile. That's why that's the next, um, next little um, slide that we add onto that. We can feel that that's the 50th percentile because 50% of my data is from here on down. All right, now what I want us to think about is what percentile are we looking at if we are right here? All right, so if I'm right there, if I wanna draw this, how much area is from here on down? All right, and if you think about all these five numbers so far, they had to total up to 50%. Well, if I add another 34%, I'm gonna be at 84%, right? And that's saying that from here on down, right, 
84% of my data, all of these numbers are from this X value, whatever that is on town. All right, now let me erase a good chunk of this so we can think about what is gonna happen when I look at the percentile here, right? If I wanted to do that, well, keep in mind, we just said all of these numbers add up to 50%, but I would like to get rid of that one, right? Because I just wanna know what these numbers from here on down add up to. So let me erase all of my little markings there. All right, and we can see that's the 16th percentile. And then by adding and subtracting these numbers, we can pick up the other percentiles, the 97.5th percentile, the 2.5th percentile, right? So we can convert those percentile, excuse me, those middle percents, the middle 68, right? Here is the middle 68. We can take a look at the middle 95, and we can look at the middle 99.7, and we can convert them to whatever percentiles we need. And you need to use percentiles for when you're using your inverse norm calculation, which we're gonna practice in just a bit. All right, so if you ever wanna do the backwards problems, the percentile problems, you quite literally need a percentile. And the empirical rule just isn't built with percentiles, so we need to convert them. All right, so let's practice these percentile problems, or what I call the backwards problems. So let's, let's start with the uniform distribution, right? I'm gonna say, hey, I have a uniform distribution, all right? I'm gonna say I'm uniformly distributed. You can see I've got a 1.5 here and a four here. And if you're wondering where I got that 0.4, all right, pause the video and try and think about, okay, where did I get that 0.4? All right, and we'll, I'll, I'll review it in just a moment. But what I want you to figure out is I want you to figure out the 30th percentile. So what number is here on the x-axis? Right? So that 30% of the area of my rectangle is from here on down. So from here on down, right, what, what would that base B, how do I find that particular K value, the 30th percentile? All right, so pause the video for a moment and see if you can get ahead of me, right? We wanna practice these things so that you're ready to go on your homework and on a midterm. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about is how on earth did I get the point for? All right, well, if I look at this, if I look at my x-axis and I look at the base, right, I go high minus low, I'm always looking for the range, right, which is 2.5. And the height is always the reciprocal of that range. So if I do one over that height, one over 2.5, I'm getting 0.4, and that's where that number came from. So even though I gave it to you in this graph, I technically could have asked you to get it on your own because it's the reciprocal of the base, right? You always find the range, high minus low, and then reciprocate it. Okay, now let's focus on how on earth I get to this K value. So when you're talking about the uniform distribution, use base times height and set it equal to the percentile. So my base and my height, right, should be equal to 30%. Well, I don't know what my base is. I always know what my height is because my height is uniform. All right, now let me back this out a bit. If I wanna solve for my base, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply 2.5 on either side, right? This is gonna cancel and just leave me with my base and I'm gonna find this number. And a lot of times I get students that tell me this is my answer. And this is inherently wrong. It's not that you haven't, you, let, me, let me rephrase that. You've done everything correct up to here, but this cannot be your answer. And here's why I wanna talk about this. Think about this number, it says your base is 0.75, but we know every variable, every value of our variable has to be between 1.5 and four. And think about 0.75, it's over here, right? That's not even in this rectangle. So my answer, my end answer can't be 0.75. So how on earth is that happening here? Well, what's going on is I need this distance to be 0.75. So keep in mind, I'm running out of colors, let me say, keep in mind I started at 1.5. So I need to go 0.75 units down from my starting point of 1.5. So what I need to do is take my starting point, add to it 0.75, and then get to 2.25. Now 2.25 is between 1.5 and four, right? That's inside my sample space. So that's what we need to be careful with when we're doing these. We can't forget to add our A value or our starting value to our base, all right? So I need to take 0.75 and add it to 1.25. And if you think about uh, how that might work, imagine that you did 2.25 minus 0.75, right? You would go ahead and you would get back to 1.5. 
All right. So with that, don't forget that you've got to add your A value to your base and then always add units to your answer. All right. So now let's also take a look at doing the percentile problems with inverse norm. So if you're on either the standard normal curve or you're on a regular normal curve, you're gonna use inverse norm, but again, you need a percentile, right? And if, if you're thinking about things in terms of the empirical rule, that's a middle percent, and that is not a percentile. All right, so here, let's say I wanted to find the X value that gives me the 75th percentile. So take a moment, right? Pause the video, get onto your calculator and see if you can find that number, right? And I'm hoping that once you unpause it, you're gonna see, well, I want the 75th percentile. I'm gonna plug that in and you can see I get 98.09. And graphically that seems about right because we've got a 90 over here and a 102 here. So if I was just eyeballing it, 98.09, that seems like a reasonable get. And I'm gonna erase that just so that we don't double up on the next graph. All right, now I want you to take a moment, see if you can find me the cutoff for the top 5%. All right, so pause the video, okay. Now, when you unpause it, I'm gonna get enough folks that tell me the answer to this is 70.26, all right? And if you've got that, that's, that's fine. You're on your way, but we do need to tweak some things because think about where 70.26 is. It's over here, right? Graphically, that can't be the, the, the cutoff for the top 5%. And the reason for that is you didn't put this into your calculator as a percentile. If this is the top 5%, then 95% is from here on down, right? So this is the 95th percentile. And if you're not putting that into your calculator, and I'll just, I'll erase that for a moment and just forward it with the next thing. If you're not putting the 0.95 into your calculator, you're gonna wind up getting 70.26 when really you want 109.74. So just be careful in that when you go to use that inverse norm or even um, the uniform version and the base times height, you have to put a percentile. It's from a certain number on down, like what area is from here on down, right? And 95% of the area under that curve is from here on down. So the cutoff for the top 5% is the same as the cutoff for the bottom 95% and the bottom 95% is the 95th percentile. All right, so that wraps up our chapter five, six summary. Thanks so much, everyone. I'll see you in a few. Bye.